All right, so I think we can get started, folks. Um, the topic here is uh, pertinent if you are the kind of company that uh, is has to design manufacturing facilities where you have a lot of different products, maybe similar but different in, in various ways, and you have to figure out how you're going to get materials to the points of use. Because the number one challenge in those kind of environments is you have small batch sizes all the way down to batch size of one, right, where everyone coming down the, the line is different. And uh, you have a lot of different parts to manage, right? So a lot of variety. And so how do you, how do you handle that? And that's kind of our specialty at Leonardo Group is mixed model manufacturing. So I just wanted to share with you our thinking on how we would go about designing and then managing a, uh, a material delivery system. And you've got some choices to make. Uh, so it's not just one solution fits all. There, there are a lot of different choices. I think there are five of them we've identified. So we're going to walk you through uh, how that works. So here's the agenda. Uh, so the scope is we're going to define what we mean by high mix low volume briefly and what we mean by material flow and what kind of industries typically fall into that category. And I think that uh, the good news is a lot of a lot of companies do. It's not that rare that you have those uh, those kind of challenges. And it's something that's becoming more and more prevalent as more and more products proliferate and the old ones don't go away, but you have to keep adding the new ones. You've got new different materials constantly. Uh, so we're going to look at the five strategies uh, that we could uh, we could uh, apply for getting the parts to where they need to be so that an operator can you know build the product. Uh, what are the parameters we need to understand? You know, the data we need to have to kind of make that decision. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about AI because I think AI could, I mean, AI is getting included in everything, isn't it? I mean, everything we do now has like a little AI button on it somewhere. So I want to uh, talk about how AI might help us uh, determine and then manage uh, that kind of material delivery system. And then uh, next steps, what, what can you do right away, you know, to get started on this? So let's, let's start with a, a definition. Simple definition. So what do we mean by high mix low volume? Well, it means you have a lot of different products or models within the same family. So we're not saying that these products are totally different. That really wouldn't make much sense. Because if you have two products that are totally different, they probably have totally different processes. So they're not going to be running down the same line. They have you know, different work that needs to get done, fundamentally different. But what we're talking about more is like um, very common in, say, I'll well, just pick an industry. Pick the air conditioning industry where you're making air conditioners, but if you ever tried to buy one, they have lots of models. And those models are not built on dedicated lines, each one. They're, you know, they're built on the same line, but they have some variation, uh, you know, that, that takes place. Same thing with cars, although surprisingly cars, automobiles are not as variable as you might, you know, you might think. Uh, I found that out when I was shopping for a, a, a car, a Toyota Camry, and I test drove a few of them and I, I, I realized, hey, you know, these, these, there's no point in test driving a bunch of these because they're all pretty much the same. And the kind of choices you can make, the kind of options you can select are relatively small, relatively low compared to other kinds of products. And, and we've worked for uh, a long time alongside Toyota material handling fork trucks. And uh, that's where you have a lot of options like the customers can specify a lot of different options. Uh, so much more than say the automotive industry. Uh, also in a mixed model environment, the order quantity can be low or, or one, you know, so here comes one product and the one right behind it is different on the line. Uh, you can build these on the same line or you might have assembly cells, sometimes how companies try to handle that variety. So what, what kind of uh, examples I already shared with you, fork trucks is a really a good one. Uh, some other uh, examples I've worked with in the past is uh, building controls. This is a company that was making you know, thermostats and sprinkler systems and that, that kind of thing for, for commercial buildings. And they had so many different varieties and products and sizes. It was quite overwhelming. And uh, jet engine insulation covers, you might say, what the heck is that? Uh, you know, that's kind of specialized. But uh, that was a former client of mine. They were making 
covers that would go over certain components in a jet engine to protect them from direct heat. Like you might have a bolt that you needed to cover because you didn't want direct heat on that bolt. And they had literally thousands of different, uh, you know, different products, but all very similar. I mean, all basically made out of the same raw material, uh, but different sizes, different shapes. So um, that's kind of what we're, we're discussing here. But you can decide for yourself, but I think probably you can appreciate what I'm, what I'm describing here, that kind of environment. So in general, industries in general, aerospace is very uh, low volume. I mean, you, we don't build that many airplanes relative to other products. Uh, but they have a lot of parts on them. I think a, a typical uh, commercial airliner has 40,000 different components or some, something like that. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, electronics and computers, industrial products, I already mentioned um, uh, air conditioners, but you know, electric motors, you name it, there, there's a, a lot of variety there. Pumps, valves, um, mixed model production in general. That's why we call it mixed model production. So uh, you know, we're not putting any limits on who could fit into that category. Now, this is different. What I'm describing here is different from what we might call a job shop. Mixed model manufacturing is applicable not so much to a job shop environment. And by job shop, I mean manufacturing uh, environments where you don't have a fixed routing. You're not really flowing. You have a bunch of machines or resources or workbenches but uh, you don't have a well-defined flow of that product. You don't have an assembly line per se, but you, what you have are orders that come in and get kind of designed based on customer specifications. And then that product would have to go or, or batch would have to go from one resource to another and then to another. And typically it sits in front of a machine or, or a workbench when it, when it moves. So lead times in a job shop tend to be longer and the trick, the key to success with the job shop is trying to limit the whip. And there are techniques you can apply to help you do that. There's a law, a law, Little's Law says, you know, basically in plain English, the more stuff you have out on the factory floor, the longer it's going to take to get anything done. So if you can limit the amount of uh, product or, or units you're working on without running out of work, then you're going to improve your throughput, improve your, uh, your lead time through that system. So flow manufacturing is different. We're talking about basically an assembly line kind of environment, which experiences taught us that that's basically the most efficient way to build products, right, is in, in a flow. So um, the products are going down the same line. It doesn't have, it, it, the product doesn't have to share every single step or every single resource. There can be diversions kind of like a, like a railroad, you know, where the, the cars can go off onto a spur and then they can come back. Those kind of designs are perfectly okay. But basically people are going, the products are going down the same line is what we mean by flow manufacturing. Okay, so basic our basic goals here, very <laughs> obvious and high level goals are for material management is we don't wanna run out. We don't wanna stop the line because we don't have the parts. We need to do the work. And you have a worker sitting there with nothing to work on. So that is not a good thing. However, we don't want to overcompensate, you know, to avoid running out of parts by having too much. So it's, you know, we're looking for the Goldilocks level of inventory, not too much, not too little. And we're trying to achieve that. We, we don't really use the term minimize inventory because that may not be the Goldilocks zone, right? If we absolutely minimize it, that may not be flexible enough, responsive enough if something changes. And then overall, with our material delivery system, we don't want to waste money. By that, I mean, we don't want to, we, we don't want to have a lot of non-value added kind of activity in our material delivery system. It doesn't really add value to that process. Uh, for example, overstaffing or uh, investing in, maybe investing in uh, expensive equipment that we don't really need. You know, there are a lot of uh, potential sources of waste. Uh, in fact, the, the Toyota production system, seven ways can be applied here pretty well. Now, in terms of doing things right, doing things correctly, we have the, the seven rights of material flow or material management. So these are the things we need to do right. 
right, to be successful. We need to have the right part, including the right revision letter, if that if that's an issue. We want to have the right quantity. It, it doesn't have to be one, but it's a it's a calculated or determined engineered quantity. Uh, we need to deliver it to the right location in the right container, in the right order or the right sequence, delivered at the right time, and with the right total cost. And I put total in a bold because it's not just the material handling costs we're talking about. Uh, we also have to look at the impact on the operators, right? the people are using that material. So we might, we might say, if we don't get this right, we might say, well, uh, material handling is a non-value added step, so I want to reduce the number of handlers. But the negative of that is, uh, could be a negative impact on the operators. Or maybe today we have operators that are required to get their own parts. I walk somewhere, get parts, come back. So they're essentially doing material handling work as well as building the product. We don't really like that, generally speaking. So adding some material handlers would free up the operator's time, which is typically a higher skill level, uh, to not have to go get their own parts. In fact, our kind of ideal, uh, if we had our druthers for material delivery, is the kind of the surgeon analogy. I don't know if you've, you've heard of this, but... In the past, I mean, in the somewhat distant past now, uh, surgeons would have to, you know, be responsible for their own tools, their own instruments, and lay them out and know where things are and get them themselves. And what we've evolved to is more the, the situation where you want the surgeon doing surgery, just like in a factory. You want the operators building the products. And so in a, in a modern hospital, you typically have an assistant next to the surgeon and the surgeon just asks for something, or if it's obvious, just just puts out his or her hand and they put the instrument right into the hand so that no time is wasted looking for stuff. And that would, I think that, that would be a, kind of an ideal uh, level of excellence that we'd want to uh, strive for in material delivery. Okay, so here's, let's get into it. We, we've got the five um, five different strategies. Here's the what, I, what I'm calling the classic lean material flow chain, the classic material delivery strategy as a baseline. So let's take a look at this for a second. We have suppliers, outside suppliers, and they're delivering. And classically, they would deliver not to the factory floor, but to a warehouse. And that's especially if they're delivering larger quantities. Right? So we have a warehouse of parts that the supplier is feeding. And then from the warehouse, we deliver to what's called a supermarket, or sometimes companies call this a market. So what is this? Well, the market, the supermarket is a, an inventory location uh, on the factory floor, right? It's inside the factory and it contains an assortment of parts, not in the quantities you would find in the warehouse, but they're there. And they, uh, they are used, those parts are used to feed the actual points of use, right? The workstations where people are doing the work. Now, we sometimes get pushback on the supermarket. Why do you need a supermarket? They are just adding more inventory in there. Well, a couple of pushbacks. Number one, if you're bringing material in from outside suppliers based on uh, kind of an MRP logic, you know, what do I need minus what do I have, you know, equals what I need to go buy. So, if what I have includes the supermarket, then the MRP logic is not really buying more inventory. You're just, you're just putting it in a different location, right? You're putting some of it in the supermarket and some of it in the warehouse. So that's one pushback on that objection. But second, uh, second reason for wanting a supermarket is part of our goal for material management is we don't want a lot of material at the point of use where the operator is. We don't want to stock a lot of material there. Now in the past, companies have, you know, have been doing that commonly where you'll, you'll want to stock a bunch of material at the station so you don't have to replenish it. So you have a, a kind of a warm, fuzzy feeling that the operator is not going to run out. But in fact, we don't want to do that. We want to minimize without running out, we want to minimize the amount of material that we have at the station. 
It makes it a lot easier for the operator. They're more productive. They have more room. We're not occupying expensive factory floor space, which is storage at the points of use. So how do we efficiently keep these workstations, the points of use, stopped? We can't do it from the warehouse uh, for a number of reasons. One is the warehouse probably is too far away. It's probably not right there, right? It's probably It could very well be in another building. So that's one challenge, right? We'd have a lot of movement. If we have a very small quantity at the point of use, we'd have to be replenishing really often from the warehouse. And, uh, and that could be a lot of movement. The other problem with a warehouse is the warehouse needs to be a controlled environment from an inventory accuracy point of view. In other words, anything that goes into the warehouse and anything that goes out of the warehouse needs to be transacted because on a computer, right? In your inventory system, if you don't transact it, then you don't know what's in the warehouse. And so it's, it's critically important that you get that process under control. So when you get a receipt from an outside supplier to the warehouse, it's received in properly. And that when it gets moved out of the warehouse, in this case, in this example, to the supermarket, that's also a transaction. So uh, in addition to the distance and lots of movements, you would have lots of transactions coming from the warehouse if you were trying to resupply the workstations from the warehouse. Lots of inventory transactions. And what's the problem with that? Well, where do, where do errors enter into our inventory system? You know, the errors happen, right? And part of the, part of the purpose of having, uh, uh, you know, just regular audits, cycle counting, for example, is that you want to try to find those errors and fix the balances, fix the inventory balances. But where do errors occur? Well, they occur during the transaction where you either don't transact or you, transa you transacted incorrectly. So the more transactions that we require, the more possibility of introducing errors into our inventory accuracy measurements. So I think I, <laughs> I, think I beat that horse <laughs> a little bit. So in, in general, then we want to use this kind of methodology to have a relatively small, but larger than at the workstations, amount of inventory in the supermarket. And from there, we can replenish the points of use a lot more efficiently and, and, and easily because it's closer to the stations. And we do not require, at least the way we teach it, we do not require transactions between the supermarket and the point of use. Now, again, pushback. People say, oh, well, then you don't know what's in the supermarket, you know, if you don't transact. And that is that is true. Uh, however, the amount of inventory in the supermarket is low compared to the warehouse, so less risk there. And the other thing is the supermarket is a Kanban system. It's under Kanban control, so it's more visual. We can see what's there. Uh, so that from an inventory management point of view, the location of the supermarket material is actually the same as the location from the points of use. This is it's the same inventory location. So strictly speaking, I can't tell what's in the supermarket versus what's on the line, but because it's such a small quantity, I don't care. The benefit of not having to transact is much greater than the benefit of not knowing where everything is exactly, because it's all in a relatively small geographic or physical area, and it's not a lot of inventory. So that's that's our story and we're sticking to it. <laughs> okay. Now, you notice a little crown here, certified supplier. As we get more mature in this basic arrangement, then uh, we would like to evolve our suppliers to bypass the warehouse completely and deliver directly to the supermarket. So we still have to receive it correctly, right, with a transaction, but it doesn't go to the warehouse, it goes to the supermarket. Now, how or under what conditions would we certify a supplier to do that? Well, number one, the supplier has to be delivering 100% quality because we're not doing any receiving inspection. You know, maybe the first couple shipments from a new supplier to validate them, but in general, we don't want to have to do receiving inspection. So we're assuming because we have a, a tight relationship with that supplier that what they're giving us is good product, right? Good parts. So they have to be able to do that. Otherwise, this is not going to work. Second thing is they have to be able to deliver in supermarket quantities. 
So what that means is that the number of shipments from the supplier to the supermarket is going to go up, right? We're going to have more shipments because they're theoretically delivering in small, small or smaller quantities than they did before. And again, there's a pushback from material folks saying, yeah, that's going to drive our transportation costs up. Well, uh, it, it might if you don't do it right. But what companies like Toyota typically do is they set up a milk run system. And in the case of Toyota material handling, they own the trucks. That's not required, but they own the trucks and they go out on a milk run to various suppliers in a geographic area and they pick up full containers and they drop off maybe recyclable empty containers on a daily basis. I mean, this is actually how they do it. And uh, so they can maintain the low inventories that they're shooting for in the supermarket uh, without really running into too much risk with, um, you know, with, with missed deliveries or, or uh, excessive transportation costs. So that is the, that's the basic uh, baseline model. Okay. Hope you like that. That was a little lengthy. So let's, let's, let's go and look at the various options. The five that, that I discussed. So first one is called zero kidding. So under this scenario, we're trying to set up a material delivery system that doesn't require us to create kits, you know, sets of parts. So how do we do that? Well, we, we would need to, to be successful. We would need to organize all the material at or near the points of use. Everything, in other words, an operator at a station has in front of him or her all of the parts that would be needed for all of the models that might pass in front of that operator. We don't need to deliver them in the form of a kit or one at a time. They're already there under a Kanban system, typically. Now, I mentioned here that could sound like da a daunting task, right? <laughs> Especially with lots of parts. How do we do that? Well, if this was really our goal, we could, uh, if, spa if the space is not, not sufficient, we could do exchange carts. So, uh, we would have to have a little bit of space for a cart, maybe on wheels. But for certain models, you would pull the cart forward to the station. The parts you need are on that cart. Here comes another one that doesn't need those parts, but needs parts on another cart. You'd pull it forward, basically organized by, by model, right? So you're not exchanging these carts every time a unit shows up in front of you, but uh, you're able to do it fairly efficiently. So what I say, what I, what I say here is that when SMEM, so you might say, what is that? You've heard of SMED, right? Single minute exchange of dyes. So this is single minute exchange of materials so that you could do essentially a line changeover very quickly by just pulling a cart away and pulling the next cart forward within a few seconds, 30 seconds, you know, it, it depends on how you've set this up, but uh, you might be able to manage a higher variety of materials in that way without having to kit. So what's the positive of that? Well, you don't have to you don't have to have a kitting process really, which is, you know, which requires more people, maybe more effort to do that, uh, because all of the material can be replenished via Kanban cards or Kanban signals. Uh, also, you don't have to be as concerned about the sequence, like if something gets out of order uh, coming down the line, because all the parts are there. So if a unit shows up for whatever reason, we don't want this to happen, it shouldn't happen. But if it does, you're not stopped because the material that you need for that unit is, is already there, right? It's already in front of you as an operator. So you don't need to kit and you can use a standardized Kanban system where you, you get a card and that's a signal to refill that bin. And there's instructions on the card, what the quantities are, need, are gonna need to be, what the, you know, what the quantities uh, uh, you know, need to be and those bins can be put back in place. Uh, the negative, well, it was one big negative that we've, we've um, run into, and that is when you ask operators to select their own parts, you're asking for a couple things that are negative. Number one, they can make a mistake, right? The operator can put his or her hand in the wrong bin and pick the wrong part. So that, that can certainly happen. And there are ways to try to address that. Uh, there are um, pick to light systems, for example. Maybe the, the unit has an RFID label and, and the bins that are the ones with the right parts for that unit get, get a little light that lights up. 
things like that. But that's adding that's adding a layer of complexity that you know we may you know not want to have to to do uh, those those kind of systems. Sometimes uh, bins might have a little door or a little drawer or something like that. There there are ways of trying to reduce you know to poke a yoke this part selection process, but um, still you have that risk. The other th the other problem with giving the operators everything they need for all products is the time it takes to select. So if you look at one of these workstations and have your stopwatch with you and you record the amount of time that an operator is looking for and selecting the parts and maybe kind of like doing a, a, a mini kit in front of them on the bench, you're getting the parts they need, organizing them versus working on the product, you're gonna find sometimes a shockingly high percentage of non-value added work at that station because essentially they're doing material handling, right? They're selecting the parts, organizing them before they can actually start work on the product. And that can be, as I said, shockingly high percentage. By shockingly, I mean like 30 or 40% of the total cycle time could be involved in part selection, walking, you know, those kind of things. And so that's not, that's not a good thing. Now, uh, I guess I'm trying to make a case for, I'm not a big fan of, of trying to do this. I'm offering it to you as an option. Uh, and it can work if you have few products, you know, you don't have that many products, you don't have that many different materials. In situations like that, definitely, uh, I would recommend this, right? You know, putting the parts in small quantities in front of the operator, et cetera. But these days, that's usually not what we have. We have a lot of different products and a lot of parts that we have to manage. And this starts, you know, getting difficult to, to, to manage. Now, I, I should also mention that when I first started doing this kind of work, uh, you know, becoming a, a lean consultant, I was working with a company uh, that trained me. This is back in the 90s. And um, we were big fans of, of encouraging this, this approach. And the, the kind of the, the main instructor, the company founder of the, of, the, of the company I was working for, had this logic in his head that kidding was really bad, right? Kidding was really, uh, you know, non-value adding. Uh, at all costs, we want to avoid kidding, kidding parts. So, um, so that's kind of, that was kind of our story, you know, that we, we told for quite a few years. Uh, but uh, having left them and having, you know, seen different scenarios, this is not so much. And also things have changed from the 90s. Things are more complex. Yeah, there's a lot more mass customization that takes place today than, than 20 or 30 years ago. So, um, so I, guess, I, I guess I've said enough about this, but uh, it, it is, this can be a good solution, but more and more rare these days. Okay. Uh, Antonio, I'm going to get back to your, at the end of this, uh, if you if you wait a few minutes at the end of the uh, webinar, I'll get back to your comments. Okay. So next choice. Uh, Sorry, here's, here's an image of what I'm talking about here. So you, you have the same basic scenario, but delivering to the points of use, you have uh, either a single station or you have points of use carts to manage a higher variety of materials, but it's all under Kanban control, right? all under Kanban control. All right, next one, kidding cells. So the idea here is we would provide sets of parts to the point of use, right, to the workstations, based on the production plan, right? Based on the sequence. Uh, now these kits could be sets, you know, more than one unit worth of parts, uh, or it could be a, a single unit, right? Depends on your environment and, and what you're doing there. In this particular example I'm giving you, the kitting itself would be done at the supermarket. So we still have a supermarket because remember our long-term goal is to not have a warehouse <laughs> if we could do that. So our main uh, kitting, uh, location would be the supermarket. You'd have to have people there doing that. So looking at the production schedule, creating sets of parts that could be delivered to the workstations. Um, so they'd have to keep keep in front of it, you know, and be staging these kits at the different stations. Um, now the benefit here is it's going to save a huge. If you're giving operators a kit. And that kit could be hopefully in a very user-friendly format, like maybe a tray that has, you know, little cubbies 
for the locations for the different components um, so that it's very clear to the operator. They don't have to do a lot of searching. And it's visually clear that they have everything they need because you can just glance at the tray. And if you've got these little spaces in the tray that are open, that means you're missing something. Okay, so um, huge amount of uh, space savings at the point of use compared to a Kanban system. In fact, if you're if you're going full, you know, hundred percent on this, which again is something we'll talk about here in a minute, uh, there are no bins at the workstations. There's only the kits, right? Only the trays that people are working out of, and that tray could be one unit's worth, or it could be some quantity coming down the lines unit worth of parts. So a uh, big space saver, reduce part selection errors. And as a result, then the operators are gonna be more productive. Now, um, who's, you know, is anyone doing this? Well, you bet. I've got some really cool examples to show you here in a minute, but uh, I can think of one. It's a company you've probably heard of called Toyota and they build cars in Georgetown, Kentucky. I wonder how they did with this hurricane that happened. But um, they, they, there was a line that I, uh, on a tour that I took there, I was able to watch the engine prep line. And they were kitting the parts in a kind of a supermarket area, delivering them to the line. One And one tray had the parts they would need for one engine block. So one-to-one -one relationship. And uh, they were using AGVs because the supermarket area was a little bit farther away. Uh, they were using AGVs to do the back and forth. You know, it was like, almost like a loop, right? The little robot AGV would deliver the tray and then keep on going around, pick up the next tray, et cetera. And they had quite a few of these little, they were quite small little AGVs. So um, I was talking to an engineer and I said, well, you know, gee, this sounds like a lot of work. I mean, you had to add some staff over here to do this kidding and stuff like that. So can you share with me like some overall results, you know, benefits? And he said, he said, yeah, in, even, even having to add the extra people uh, to do the kidding, our overall, if you add those people plus the people on the engine prep line, add them together, we achieved a 5% productivity boost, right, gain. 5% more productive. And uh, remember, this is for a line that was already quite, uh, quite lean before. I mean, this is a Toyota assembly line before. And even after that, when they implemented this kidding methodology, uh, they were able to uh, improve productivity another 5%. So I thought that was, that was pretty impressive. So people had no bins in front of them. They only had the tray that would just move down the line in front of them, and they'd take the parts they need and they'd do their work. And then here comes the next engine block, here comes the next tray, so on and so forth. So, um, uh, you know, for, for a company that's already as productive, let's say, as a Toyota assembly line, which is kind of the gold standard. In fact, I, I, I um, subscribe to a number of newsletters, lean, lean manufacturing newsletters, and there's one called um, All About Lean, which I recommend. It's a German professor, but a former Toyota employee. And he recently did a tour of the automotive factories in Germany, where he's located. And one of the things he looks for is, is value add percent. And he said he was able to do that because he was able to compare because he knew what the Toyota standards were. And Toyota is head and shoulders above even other Japanese companies in terms of percent value added you know, on their assembly lines. It's not 100 percent, but uh, but it's it's the, the top of the heap, right? It's kind of the gold standard. So he would compare the, the plants he was visiting on a tour with, with those, those plants. Okay, so this sounds like a good option. So it looks something like this. We have, we have the same kind of uh, upfront processes, supplier delivering to the supermarket if possible, if they're certified, and then it goes to a kitting process, usually in or nearby the supermarket, and then we deliver to the points of use. Okay, deliver the kits to the points of use. So easy to understand. Okay, next one. Now, here's the one that I'm, I'm most excited about to share with you. And I have some pictures here. This is called kitting integration. So uh, we want to design, we're, we want to go with more of a kitting process because this is going to reduce the 
amount of material at the station, save us a lot of space, reduce uh, operator material handling, etc. Right. But uh, we want to integrate that kitting process with the line itself running at a certain tack time. So we want to design a kitting process that runs at the same tack time. Preparing the kits is running at the same speed as the line and integrate it directly in. Uh, so essentially we're co-locating the supermarket or the material with the line, but not in front of the operators, but as part of this kitting, number of kitting workstations, let's put it that way. So um, you can handle, in that scenario, we can, you can handle a very high mix, different products coming down the line. Uh, you need to have the volume sufficient to justify, you know, setting this up. And the positives are basically it's a minimum whip inventory. Uh, I don't know how you could get less than that on the line, right? Minimum whip. Uh, we're going to replenish that supermarket via Kanban. So we still have a Kanban system, but it's supermarket back to warehouse, right? Or back to supplier would be the, the Kanban piece of it. And if our goal here is single piece flow, right? One piece at a time, then this is approaching much closer to that. We're getting closer and closer to that goal of true single piece flow or what they sometimes call it Toyota, they call it one by one production, trying to do things one at a time, one by one, including the material delivery. So one by one material delivery, this is getting much closer to that goal. Now, uh, the negative, you need to balance this, be able to balance this to the line tack time. You're using factory space, right, to, to do this. And you have to really design the system with carts and trays and there's some infrastructure to make this happen. Now, let me share with you. This is pretty cool here. Oh, well, here's the picture. So supplier to warehouse. Then we've got a kitting process is part of the line itself. So kitting and the line or the points of use are integrated together. And we're pulling material from the supermarket. They're all within the same kind of very tight environment. So here's what I wanted to share with you. I hope you can see this, but I'll explain to you what you're looking at here. This is a project that I, I worked on. It was a joint venture with Toyota and a big company you may have heard of that make, they make green, green tractors. And uh, what you have here is a kind of a multi-purpose uh, uh, scenario here. You can see the bins along the side. So those are actually Kanban bins, but we don't need to uh, have more than one. Uh, we just have one bin for different hardware items, small parts that are used on most of the, the units. These units, by the way, are, are uh, seating row unit. They call them row units. They're the, it's about a motorcycle size uh, piece of equipment that puts a seed in the ground. And you can have rows of these lined up behind a tractor. So you could have a, you could have a planter with eight row units or uh, 16, typically in some kind of 12, you know, some kind of even number, um, all the way up to, I think, 32, if I'm not mistaken. A huge bar behind the tractor and a huge tractor, uh, you know, planting 32 rows at the same time. So that's, that's what they were building here. And they had a lot of variety, right? a lot of different models. So we have a Kanban. Now, why don't we need more than one bin? Because this cart is on wheels, you can see. And the black line there in the picture is a magnetic tape on the floor. So it's going to go, it's going to travel on a, on a, a, a circle. Uh, and it's going to go, you know, through the various workstations where there's an operator there doing work. And then it's going to get offloaded that row units can be taken off with a robotic arm, going to pick it up because it's pretty heavy and move it off. And then that cart is going to go around in a circle back to the kitting area, but it's part of the same line. It's running at the same speed. And I don't need more than one bin for the, the small items because the, the people in the kidding area can just look. And if it's running low, just put some more in there. You know, don't need, it doesn't need to be very fancy. Uh, you're not going to run out because there's, you're only building these one at a time. Every time you complete a unit, this cart is going to go back to the kidding area. Now, on the top is where you have more of the unique parts, including there's a frame, like a major frame that gets gets mounted onto uh, a fixture that you see on top here. So all, more of the unique uh, parts are on top for the operators. Now you can't really see it in the picture, I'll have to tell you about it, but there's also a flat panel 
monitor on each of the carts uh, that displays the work to be done for that unit at that particular location, at that station. Um, now, how does it know? Well, you've got RFID tags on the unit and on the floor, so it knows where it is and it knows what unit, uh, you know, it knows what station it's at and it knows what unit uh, is being worked on and it gives you the work instructions. Uh, it will also require you to confirm some quality checks before it will release it out of this station. So it's not enough to do the work and move it on out. You've got to do the work and you've got to do, if, if specified, uh, you have to verify certain quality you know, steps that you, you just did yourself, presumably. So that was another pretty cool, cool feature. So this is an AGV workstation, basically, that would travel around to the different workstations and then go back to a kitting area where the cart would be restocked with the next unit in the sequence. And you might be building, like I said, 32 of the same row unit, one after another, that could happen. Or you might be building eight or whatever the number is, right, for that order. So uh, this is still in use today and uh, it's been very successful. And I, th I thought that was a especially super cool uh, thing that we worked on and, 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 and did. Okay, so next one, uh, next opportunity is, is still kidding. We still wanna do kidding, but we can't, we can't do it out of the supermarket. And there might be various reasons for that. One reason could just be a practical one. We have so many different items that we need to manage that uh, they don't fit in the supermarket, right? <laughs> Trying to put everything we need in the supermarket is just crazy. So that might be one practical reason. There also might be safety uh, or environmental reasons why we can't do it on the factory floor. Uh, for example, this insulation blanket that I told you about, aerospace uh, jet engine insulation blankets that we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. I'm not sure if it was asbestos, but it's kind of like that, right? <laughs> Some, the, the material they were using to create this heat shield uh, was not something you wanted floating around out on the factory floor. So they had, it wasn't exactly a clean room requirement, but it was a cleaner space where they would do the cutting of this material and, and creating these little kits. And they had to do that offline, outside of the factory floor. Uh, un understandably, right? Safe, safety and, and, and health reasons. Okay, so uh, we still have the benefits of kitting by doing it, but we don't have the benefit of being able to kit to attack time or more kitting to orders. Uh, we're not as directly connected. So not as, not as good from that point of view, but uh, still we get the benefit of not having a lot of material on the factory floor in front of the operator. Longer distances to deliver as well. So again, this, this is something we may have to do. So the kidding process in this example is now moved back to the warehouse area. And we don't really need a supermarket from that point of view. We're delivering directly to the points of use. We probably just have a staging area as opposed to a, a Kanban supermarket. Okay. So finally, the last one is probably the more realistic one. This is probably what you're going to actually do if you, if you start embracing uh, any of these techniques. Uh, and it's not to pick one, it's to use a hybrid approach, a mixture of different approaches. And this is, this is actually what Toyota Material Handling uh, in, in Columbus, Indiana does. So it's a combination of the methods that we just discussed. In other words, small, inexpensive uh, items that can fit into a, a small container, don't take up a lot of floor space in front of the operator, those are the kind of items you might want to consider a Kanban system, like option number one, just straight Kanban. We re refill the Kanban bins out of a supermarket area on the floor and uh, perfect. And in, in point of fact, approximately 50 to 60% of the part numbers, items that are consumed at Toyota Material Handling, now this is a fork truck factory, 50 to 60% are delivered to the points of use via Kanban, right? So pretty high percentage. And then the other 40% or so, uh, we have to use another technique, right? Different techniques for getting those parts. So uh, so, so basically, the, 
you know, you don't need in that scenario, if you can Kanban 60 percent of the parts, you don't need to kit them. You don't need to be kitting individual bolts and washers and nuts and screws. They're, you know, they're they're common parts, hopefully, as much as possible. And you can just replenish those in small bins right in front of the operator. So if they're right there in front of the operator, there's no uh, walking required. Um, probably the loss of having to select the parts is not so great. Now, everything else, heavy stuff, big stuff, unique stuff, options, you know, custom parts, everything else is going to have to be delivered either one at a time or in sets. So what's very common at Toyota is, uh, for example, uh, hydraulic cylinders for a fork truck. You don't necessarily want to have to be delivering them one fork truck at a time. That's a lot of back and forth, but they would typically create a custom cart. And maybe that cart would uh, hold eight fork trucks worth of cylinders. And they, the carts would be delivered to the stations in a parking spot. The cylinders would be taken off the cart. They could be different cylinders, depending on what's coming down the line. So sequencing is important. And uh, they would monitor, the material handling folks would monitor and be able to pull out the empty cart, deliver the next one. Or you might have two parking spots so you can deliver the next one in anticipation and not take the risk of slowing down the line or stopping the line. So, uh, and then you have, you may have a huge, big, heavy parts that you can't even do that, like engines and the transmissions where you have to deliver those one at a time. So again, um, at Toyota, they deliver engines, for example, on an AGB. It's, it's very much a back and forth kind of movement. So we don't need a person going, you know, going 20 feet over there and coming 20 feet back all day. So they have a little AGB that, that, that does that movement, but it's one engine at a time. So under a hybrid scenario, yes, you are consuming more space and in inventory, but if you can pull all the big stuff off and deliver it via more of a kit or more of a one at a time sequence delivery, then the amount of space you're consuming at the station is relatively modest. You're storing the small stuff at the station. Um, now, managing all of this requires, you know, uh, requires some, some training and some expertise, obviously. Uh, especially at, at Toyota Material Landing, every fork truck coming down that line can be different. They have something like 50 base models, if you, if that, if you can believe that. I mean, they have all the different fuels. You know, you've got gasoline, you've got diesel, you've got electric, you've got gas, natural gas, and you've got all these different capacity sizes. Uh, they don't all go down the same line. They have some smaller, lower volume lines for the really oddball uh, products, but a lot of them go down that one same line. So you, you've got to manage this very, very closely. Um, so it's not something you can achieve overnight for sure. They have lots of experience doing this. So in a hybrid, you've got some parts going via Kanban to the points of use here, and you have some going to a kitting process and then being delivered either one at a time or they're being delivered in sets, right? Small sets to the points of use. And that's pretty much this strategy number five is pretty much what, you know, what I think a lot of you will end up with. Okay, so a couple tricks. Uh, one of them is pulling kits. Uh, this uh, example I gave you of an aerospace uh, heat shields, they, they were delivering, before we arrived, they were delivering kits. And the basic rule was look in the system and 30 days ahead of need, planned need on the factory floor, not actual need, but planned need, prepare the kit, put it in a tote, and then deliver that tote to the production area. And your job is done, right? mission accomplished. And so when it arrived, they had something like 100 kits, totes laying around. Well, not laying around, they're on shelves and stuff, but uh, some of them have been there for quite a long time. You know, maybe priorities changed or whatever. And also if you need a part for whatever reason, uh, and it happens to be in another kit over there, you know, as an operator, you're probably going to be tempted to go over and take that part out of that kit and use it because your need is right now and that kid's going to be needed who knows when. So uh, what we did to kind of fix this situation is we set, a, set up a, a simple rack 
And, uh, and the rule was quite simple as well. Each, each tote, like pl plastic bin, where the, the material was in, would be were labeled. And so there was not too much doubt about which one would be done next. It was all on the schedule. So we didn't have to be too concerned about designating locations on the shelf. But there was, it would only fit a certain number of totes. In fact, it would only fit about three days worth of production. And people started getting very nervous, you know, when we did this. What do you mean, only three days? I said, three days, but it only takes about half an hour to an hour to prepare a kit. So you're not in any danger of running out of work. Don't worry about that. But we're going to take these 100 kits that are on the floor and reduce them to something like 20. So uh, big difference in terms of, you imagine, the chaos and the cannibalized kits and the amount of floor space. Uh, it, it, was, it was a very simple thing, right? You don't have, didn't have to be a genius to think about this technique, but we did it, worked well, and uh, that's, that's what presumably they're still, they're still doing. Okay, so how do we do, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can post them in the, uh, in the chat, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to get to them here in just a minute. So what do we need to know uh, or think about when we're talking about designing our material delivery systems in a mixed model environment? Well, we need to know uh, how much, what's the level of part commonality. The more common, the easier it's going to be. You have common parts. If every model uses completely different parts, you're, the number of items you're going to need to manage is going to be much higher. Do you have to maintain material traceability? Uh, many industries you don't. Some you do, like medical products, like aerospace and defense. You've got to maintain some traceability on that material that could influence what you choose in terms of material delivery system. How many models do you have to deal with? And how many number of active part numbers? Is it dozens? Is it hundreds? Is it thousands? That's really going to make a difference in terms of what you choose. How far away is the warehouse from the points of use? Is it an entirely different building or is it already on the factory floor? And maybe that gives you more flexibility in terms of how you, how you deal with that. It still needs to be a controlled area, though. Remember, if your warehouse is in the same building, it needs to have a, a fence around it with a lock. <laughs> you know, uh, otherwise, you're, you're never going to really know what's in there. If people can just walk into your warehouse and take something, your inventory accuracy is going to be horrible, guaranteed. And then what is your level of mixed model manufacturing? Are you actually a mixed model manufacturer where you're mixing or are you building lot sizes, you know, you, you set up a line and you'll run it for a particular model for a while, and then you stop the line, you do a line changeover, and then you start up again and you run some quantity of some other product. That's not mixed model manufacturing. So, you know, we, we have to understand all of those things. But if you have all those parameters, then you might be able to get some help. And the help you might want to, you know, look, look into could be from AI. So I've been spending a fair amount of time playing around, I guess that's the best term I could use for it, with um, with tools like ChatGPT and Claude. And the latest version of ChatGPT, the uh, or not, it's not actually the latest, it's but it's pretty recent. It's 4.0 for Omni. Uh, the ChatGPT 4.0 can read an Excel file and um, and can actually modify that Excel file and can actually write an Excel file and give you a link to download an Excel file. And uh, that, that particular functionality is only going to get better. So what I'm envisioning, I'm just throwing this out here, a uh, very superficial recommendation. But if you have the information in, in the form of a plan for every part, PFEP, uh, and you provide some of this information we just discussed, then you can ask AI or ask ChatGPT to basically do some data mining and provide some recommendations in terms of uh, material delivery strategies uh, so that the material delivery strategy becomes part of your PFEP, right? So one item, the material delivery strategy could be Kanban. For another one, it could be kit. For another one, it could be sequenced one at a time. Uh, and you can do this as a human for sure, but um, if you have thousands of parts, it's going to take you a while. Whereas AI can go through and do that kind of analysis pretty efficiently, like almost instantaneously. You know, I don't know how long, right? It depends how big your PFEP is, but it doesn't take long. So uh, keep that in mind for the future. Uh, this, this is coming. AI is coming like fast. 
and um, and this is going to change, you know, the, the tools that we have available to us to address some of these issues. So basically, you'd have a script or a request from AI. Here, here's the data. It's in my plan for every part. It's in Excel. I'll give it to you, and I want you to analyze it and give me a material delivery plan based on this criteria. You have to describe it. Okay, so uh, I'm reaching the end here. Um, if you're interested in learning more about mixed model material flow, um, we, we are teaching classes on this at Toyota, at the Toyota factory I keep mentioning. Uh, this year, the uh, final class is in November, but it's sold out. So um, we're, we're working with them on setting up the schedule for next year. Um, and I'm certain we'll, we'll be letting you know uh, what the dates are for next year. This will be three days in the Toyota material handling factory, which is the best example of mixed model material management that exists, as far as I can tell. As far as where I've been in my 30 year lean career, this is like the best. So you get factory tours, you get to chat with the Toyota people, and then you learn from us the details of designing a mixed model material flow system in a lot more detail than we can do here.